Well, it is an immense pleasure and honor to welcome Rosalind Morris in our Pembroke seminar for a lecture today, followed by a discussion session tomorrow. I first came across Rosalind's thoughtful, thought-provoking, and always unheard of approach to everything she touches when I read an article she published in 2008, The Miner's Ear, on the oral or sonic dimensions of mining and its history in South Africa. Reading it again yesterday, as I was writing down a few notes for my introduction to her talk today, I remembered vividly how struck I was at the time by the rare, the unique blend that characterizes her writings close readings, not only of so-called discourses or texts, but also of objects or techniques, including techniques of the body, as Marcel Mauss would have said. Close readings are constantly accompanied or surrounded by an acute awareness of historical, social, economic, and political contexts. Reading again her articles, article years later uh, brought back the pleasure and emotion of the first time. I marveled again at how delicately and powerfully she auscultated the folds of language. She was lending an attentive ear, for example, to the confusion of signs that links the oral, what can be heard, and the auriferous, the gold bearing while at the same time, she was auscultating also the bodies that are entangled in these linguistic folds or vice versa. I quote, the miner's lung, she writes, is the withering, deflating double of the ear. So the article I had read, the miner's ear, was beautifully illustrated well, maybe that's not the right word at all. Uh, rather, it was punctuated or, or counterpointed, if you can say that in English, with charcoal drawings by William Kentridge. And I later discovered that Rosalind has been working closely with Kentridge, one of the most important artists I can think of. They have published together a book in 2013 that which is not drawn, William Kentridge in conversation with Rosalind Morris. And in 2015, they wove together images and narrative in order to produce a beautiful volume based on the cash, is to say the financial records of receipts and payments of a gold mine in South Africa. The result, titled Accounts and Drawings from Underground, the East Rand Proprietary Mines Cash Book 1906 is soon to be published in a revised and expanded version by the University of Chicago Press with new color drawings by Kentridge and an added coda by Rosalind. Rosalind, who is a professor of anthropology at Columbia University, where she currently teaches a class on accusation, and I really wish I could take it, uh, Rosalind has written decisive essays and articles on questions ranging from media and mediumship in the aesthetic economy of contemporary Thailand uh, to primitive accumulation in Marx, from performance theory and the anthropology of sex and gender to Derrida's legacy, torture in Abu Ghraib, or identity politics in the humanities. Rosalind has edited memorable volumes like Photographies East, The Camera and Its Histories in East and Southeast Asia, that was uh, published by Duke University Press in 2009, or Can the Subaltern Speak? Reflections on the History of an Idea, that's Columbia University Press 2010. And more recently, in The Returns of Fetishism, um, published by University of Chicago Press 2017, she has offered the most compelling account of the aftermath and fortunes of the word and notion of fetishism as coined by Charles de Brosse in 1760. Rosalind has also written two opera librettos, Cities of Salt, written in 2015 with poet and novelist Yvette Christiance, I hope I pronounced that right, 
Uh, I saw that uh, Yvette Christian is among the attendants today, I think. And composer Zaid Jabri, uh, Cities of Salt is set in the 1930s during the violent transformations that followed the discovery of oil in the Gulf states. And then there is Southern Crossings where the paths of Darwin and abolitionist astronomer John Herschel cross in Cape Town, and this uh, new opera is nearing production, I believe, this year, uh, with the same two collaborators. Last but not least, Rosalind directed, we were talking about it uh, during our waiting room time, uh, Rosalind directed We Are Zama Zama, a feature-length documentary about migrants who risk their lives scavenging for gold in the ruins of South Africa's deep industrial mines. I confess that I have seen only the trailer and I think the whole documentary is not yet uh, out, so to speak, but seeing the trailer uh, convinced me that we really should organize a screening here at Brown. Uh, as soon as we can. The video installation that grew out of the documentary film, the Zama Zama project, has been selected for this year's Berlin Film Festival, where it will be exhibited. In sum, with her multifaceted work, with her deep commitment to the people and questions she documents or makes us reflect upon, Rosalind Morris is one of the most inspiring intellectuals I know of today. I am delighted that she accepted our invitation to participate in this year's Pembroke seminar on narrating debt. The title of her talk today is The Simulacrum of Sovereign Debt, Giving, Giving In, and a Credit to Our Name. Rosalind. Gosh, uh, Peter, I'm quite overwhelmed by that introduction. That's uh, a gift, uh, something that nobody could possibly merit. Um, I'm very, of course, um, touched that you you could summon those words in relationship to my work. Um, thank you. Um, I want to thank, of course, Peter Zendi and Suzanne Stuart Steinberg for inviting me to to join you here as part of the seminar on narrating debt. And I hope that what I will have to say will speak to you um, across the miles between New York City and uh, your world there at Brown, um, and that we will find some resonances between your discourse and the concerns that I have been exploring, uh, both on my own and with my students in the course on accusation. But it's always a very special, to, a really special pleasure to be at Brown, <laughs> if one is at Brown in this strange digital way. Um, and incredibly inspiring. I mean, the questions that animate these seminars and the depth and seriousness of the, of the engagements that they afford are, are real gifts to anyone who can visit. And so um, I thank you for your hospitality. Um, uh, what is a Zoom, <laughs> a Zoom lecture is a strange format and people are always telling you, oh, you speak in small sound bites, uh, fill your screen with visual materials, and I'm not going to do that. I'm going to lecture in an old fashioned way and share with you my thinking in order that we can perhaps generate some new questions together. Um, I'm gonna to speak to you today in a manner that shuttles between two traditions. One, of political, theological and economic discourse of a largely post-structural sort. The other, a form of living and discoursing that emerges in the world of informal settlements on the peripheries of deindustrializing South Africa. And you can think of this lecture as a kind of double session, or perhaps on the model of an account book like the one that uh, Peter showed you, a double entry document. And I'm aware that not everyone will be familiar with either or both of these traditions. So I'll try to move between these worlds in a manner that makes each a source of illumination for the other. I'm staging a certain conversation, you might say, between two narrative systems or traditions sedimentations, systems that are already in touch with each other. But in this movement between narrative systems, I'm also going to be vacillating between positions, positions that could be described following Devinas as ones of speaking to and speaking about others. And I want to mark that distinction between speaking to and speaking about. 
but I include in this category of others not merely the Southern African mind scavengers, but the philosophers of religion and the epistemologists. For Levinas, speaking to is a mode of ethical relation. Speaking of is a mode of knowledge production. As an anthropologist, I don't believe I am ever able to exit this split and double path. But it is ho my hope that we can at least hold on to the ethical aspiration without relinquishing the task of understanding. So let me begin with some brief definitions of the terms of my lecture's title, starting with sovereign debt. Sovereign debt is, of course, that form of debt which is taken on by central state governments through the issuance of bonds and via the borrowing of foreign currency. It's typically used for national development purposes, and it is deemed more or less risky for lenders, depending on the creditworthiness of the borrower, a worthiness that is calculated on the basis of borrower's industrial development, natural resources, rates of employment, extent of social payments as a ratio of GDP, outstanding debt, and of course, political stability, among other factors. But I don't mean to invoke the concept of sovereign debt in this purely economistic sense. I mean also to speak of a signifier of that debt which is taken on in the name of a sovereign body. And under this sign, we mark a capacity for debt as a source of power, so long as it is recognized by others as creditability. Now, this is the econo economic discourse. Now let us turn a bit to the theological discourse. In Abrahamic tradition, such debt, that is the debt that can be, uh, uh, that is a source of power, such debt, absolute debt is ironically figured as an inversion of that originary gift from an absolutely inaccessible, unaccountable, and in some cases, unnameable source. It is by virtue of this inverted figure embedded in the aspiration to access sovereign debt that I mean to speak of a simulacral economy in which the desire for sovereignty on a political theological model is the desire for a form of absolute creditability and infinite indebtability, one that is delinked from any labor and without demand for accounting. It's my hope that both this concept and the rest of my title referring as it does to giving, giving in, and the accreditations of the name will become meaningful as we move along. But I want to anticipate the argument and sketch out its relation to the thematic of this seminar before proceeding. The material of which I speak is drawn from more than two decades of field research in the deep level gold mining communities of Southern Africa. As these once industrial mines close, people continue to seek their fortunes in the abandoned ruins. People who undertake this work are called zamazamas. The word means to try or keep on trying. It also means to gamble and to resonate. It's a word that comes to us from Izizulu, but is it is lexicalized across all the languages of Southern Africa. It is also used to designate those scavengers who pursue gold in the deep level mines. In South Africa, it is widely associated with criminality, gangsterism and antisocial violence Although my research shows that these people are rather more likely to be the victims than the perpetrators of such violence. Typically, Zamazamas are illegalized migrants. I use this term illegalized rather than illegal. They are illegalized migrants from neighboring states, although they may also be from economically marginalized spaces in South Africa. The work undertaken by Zamazamas is terrifyingly dangerous, its outcomes dubious. Moreover, the living circumstances that illegalized migrants must inhabit are ones of such extreme vulnerability to xenophobic violence, to state violence, to toxicity and environmental danger, to accident and to hunger and to chance. These circumstances make one ask why people do it. The conditions in neighboring states are specifically compelling, but they are not unique. They define the movements that and compel the movements that millions of people make daily and yearly as they flee economic destitution, rural poverty, agricultural collapse, hyperinflation, and the currency collapses associated with endless wars and sanctions. These conditions can be described as ones of what I would like to call radical indebtedness. 
And I want to convince you that there are qualities in the notion of radical indebtedness that are not fully grasped by terms like precarity, uninhabitability, abandonment, and so forth. By radical indebtedness, I mean an incapacity to take on debt, a chronic state of not having the means of paying that which is due on commodities or rent, on education or foodstuffs, and so forth. Yeah, that is to say an incapacity to take on what, it is, what is normatively the condition of being in the uh, non-graced, the unblessed world, namely debt. What is crucial about this state and what makes it more than another word for poverty is that it is a function of the judgment of others in a context of lack. Now, if every commodity exchange entails a moment of indebtedness, and if we understand the movements of people fleeing this incapacity to settle debts as aspects of diaspora formation or dissemination in Derrida's sense, we will recognize a bond between the condition of debt and the narrative of what I call unsettlement. I do not say migrancy because migrancy is of the order of a narrative that resolves itself in arrival. Whereas we are speaking of a generalized or I am speaking of a generalized condition a state of being that compels movement, but that deprives people of mobility, which includes the right to not be moved, and where the destination is infinitely deferred. So I'm gonna proceed in three movements, each of which shall take the form of a double column. The first, see this is where I should have, I should have you know, one of those great slides, yeah. On the absence of favor. Number two, on the desire for a name or creditability, and on being called names, incredibility. Number three, on surfeit, which is not a gift, or fate without fatalism. Okay, now I want to start with the following epigram. It is from Romans 4, 4. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So part one, on the absence of favor, this is column one, South Africa. On a warm spring day, three young men who make their living at Zamazamas are talking while sitting on a crumbling stone wall beneath leafy trees outside of a building that once served as the maps office of a major industrial mine. We have been making a film together and they are explaining the nature of the luck that they see in the abandoned gold mines. They are proud of their skill, mindful of their marginality as illegalized migrants and conscious too of their status as members of a small minority language group in both their home country, Zimbabwe, and in the informal settlement where they reside in South Africa. But they are also envious and a bit contemptuous of the wealth that is enjoyed as a matter of mere luck. Consider, for example, the following conversation, and I quote, there's always risk if you're going to get money, says one of the men. His younger cousin echoes him, yeah, if you're risky, at the end of the day, you'll get rich. His image of fabulous wealth comes in the person of Cristiano Ronaldo. The eldest cousin agrees. He can buy a small country, whereas some of us, we don't have enough to buy t-shirts. But when his younger cousin tries to justify Ronaldo's success as a function of the risks he takes to actualize his potential, the older man snaps, no, they are not risking. Some people, they are lucky. Like if we're talking about these players, they didn't even risk even one of the days. It is not enough, therefore, to have potential, not enough to work for a living, even if only as an athlete. Something else must enter the equation for wealth to be worthy of admiration, but it is not luck. Luck can be desired, but it cannot be admired. Risk is something else. For the young miners, risk is that extra something that transforms labor into a source not of commensurable wealth and hence not into that which is analogizable to wages, but to miraculous surfeit. Let us note here that this miraculous surfeit is not yet a divine gift. But before we get there, let us listen further. The young man asserts that sometimes it's luck, 
Sometimes it's potential. He wants to explain the intense training of talent that can make Ronaldo or Messi, and we exchange our affections, worthy of this otherwise unimaginable salary. But his cousin angrily retorts, why does luck always go to some people? And then he shouts, does God give favor? His younger cousin, briefly silent, slowly demurs, no, God doesn't give favor. But let me tell you. So both men agree. The true gift has no presence in this world. That is the gift as the form of the impossible in Derrida's sense. Hence, they trust themselves to fate <clears throat> while calling upon the ancestors. At the entrance to the mine, <clears throat> excuse me, the Tonga and Ndebele miners make their offerings and ask their ancestors to guide and assist them to keep them safe and show them the way. But they do not ask God for wealth. The mention of God giving favor seems anathema to these men. They are nominally Christian, and though they have different degrees and intensities of that faith, they have long experience in churches, and often when they are working or walking, I hear them sing or whistle or hum a hymn. This in no way conflicts with their commitments to ancestral tradition, as I shall try to explain below. But this spontaneous revulsion and agreement, which otherwise threatens to rupture the conversation, is not an ethnographic curiosity to be explained away. It is a philosophically significant claim with deep implications for how we understand debt and the gift, grace, and much more. So let us take this snippet of every disc day discourse, albeit an explicitation made for me, as an invitation to think, to labor in the service of understanding why for these men, God is the name of that which does not give which is to say, show favor. Why not? What is it about God, sovereign of all, that prohibits the showing of favor and the granting of recognition to some rather than others? Why or in what sense does this God not give gifts? That is, in fact, the orienting question of Pauline Christianity. And these men are in some sense heirs to that tradition. Or at least they are as much heirs, I would say, as is Alain Badieu or Jacques Derrida, who wrote so very differently about it. To be heir is, of course, not necessarily to be a believer. Okay. Uh, are we all right? Okay. Part one, column two, Euro American Theory Land. Once again, let us recall that epigram. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. For the faithful of Pauline Christianity, at least as articulated in the Book of Romans, grace is that which comes unbidden, undeserved, uncommensurated. This grace, this gift, is that which is incommensurable with labor, with productivity, and anything that can submit to measure and on that basis become the reason or ground for a return. But this insistence on the antinomy between act and reward, deed and recognition, leads to a question about the nature of divine recognition of any chosen community. The question concerns whether the chosen are approved by God in advance of any deeds, in which case they inherit grace and need do nothing for it. Righteousness is irrelevant in such a context and must be secured through other means. And there are you know, different Judaic and Calvinist traditions that cleave to notions of predestination in answer to that question. A related question is whether the mark of membership in the community is proof of God's choice or perversely an effort to claim it without requiring the requisite moral action. This can be phrased as a question. Is the self-inflicted mark of the community of faith itself sufficient to impute blessing? Or is this mark something which, which must be added to faith as evidence of what has been given as possibility, but must yet be realized in history through right action. And this is the essence of Romans 4, 9. Yeah? And this, of course, self-inflicted mark of the community of faith is uh, circumcision, uh, among others, in the Judaic tradition, which is also extremely important in many Southern African ancestral traditions. And the rhyme between this is one of the sources 
of the intense uh, uh, uptake, I would say, of this discourse within Southern African communities. This is essentially a question of inheritance, yeah? Is chosenness, which is to say divine recognition, inherited or not? Or to quote my young Zama Zama friends, does God give favor or not? And if he gives it, can it be conserved and transmitted? Now, for many commentators, Pauline radicalism, which is both ambivalent and let us say compromise, <laughs> consists in the double move that displaces inheritance and thus intergenerational identity with faith as the basis of divine approval. In a more contemporary eating, we might say that through this displacement, Paul attempts to liberate his community from the burden of race, that which is inherited in the flesh, while surrendering to the logic of economy Paul lamented, and I quote, for if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of none effect. The inaugural problem for Paul in Romans chapter four is that the results of labor bear glory before men, but not before God. He wants to understand how those to whom righteousness is imputed can become what they should be without being destined. He wants, that is, to know how they can become worthy of virtue by, by virtue of a choice. He wants to salvage an obligation from fate and fatalism, as do the young miners, for whom risk rather than luck is the added element. But Paul's solution, based on a rereading of the Abrahamic sacrifice, comes in the test of obedience to the law. This is the famed legalism in Paul's writings in such a manner that the law becomes the theater or space of appearance of not only an ironically liberating submission, but also of the specter of crime, failure and unfulfillment. He writes, where no law is, there is no transgression. Center stage in the space of appearance in a halo of cruel light is the debtor. And this in a double sense. The debtor is here not only the one who has not fulfilled, fulfilled an obligation, but one who thinks that by mere effort, he or she commands recognition. The debtor in Paul is the economist. And this is because in Pauline terms, there's no distinction between debtor and the one who worketh. Both are names of damnation. If by damnation, we mean exclusion from grace, which means being thrown back upon oneself, however socialized for the surplus that makes living on possible. Now you'll begin to discern something of, of a tautology in my, my, my discourse here. This is the tautology of faith. Now in the recent philosophical engagement with Paulism crowned by um, Alain Badieu, Paulism has come to be associated with a certain philosophy of conversion of the event and of a narrative transformation of the subject as that which cannot be predetermined by history, but what nonetheless arises from within it. This narrative is one in which the convert survives his or her own death and entering into blessedness is no longer entirely dependent on the sweat of his or her brow. You can see that I'm suggesting the need to supplement a recognition of political theology with an analysis of theological economics. And as a side gesture, I would note that the economic logic of Trumpism is not unrelated to this long-standing tradition in which the one who can escape work can claim a divine sanction. But that's an aside we leave for now. It has been argued, especially by Jill Robbins, very persuasively, that the storial and even biographical demand of conversion narratives is central to all Christian philosophy to such an extent that even modern Jewish philosophies cannot think themselves as Jewish without this relay through this going by way of the Christian. And, and it does so in a manner that makes recourse to the basic tropology of conversion. But conversion is typically a story of the faithful, unless as in the case, for example, of Franz Rosenzweig, it is a story of non-conversion as a return to the community of ostensibly inherited righteousness. Yet, 
By virtue of the universalist claims in philosophy and not merely theology, the Christian story that links work to debt and that forms the hinge between the gift and economy, as Derrida would formulate it, or between non-adequating reciprocity and exchangeism, as economic anthropology would have it, this story binds everyone and not merely the faithful in its narrative frame. This is because it is also the narrative of post-Protestant capitalism. It makes narrative a form of accounting and debt a narrative or at least a discursive problem. Are we okay still? Okay, part two. On the desire for a name, credibility, and on being called names, incredibility. Part two, column one, we're in Euro-American theory land. When we, they, speak of debt as that which can be settled and reconciled, when we, they, think of the one who cannot access credit as the one whose future prospects for wealth are incredible, when we, they, demand an accounting as the basis of creditability we, they, are in the realm of narrative, but also of belief, or if you like, faith. Belief or faith is what makes the narrative believable, effectual. But saying this is only to defer or displace the problem. What is worse, it risks the phenom making the phenomenon appear to be a mere matter of private consciousness, secreted or at least interior affect. Yet anthropologists and scholars of the gift, as Marcel Mons described that institution, which he called a total social fact, anthropologists and scholars of the gift know that faith is a social phenomenon, a matter of the third person. It is others who give credence to acts of faith. Credit, we can remind ourselves, is etymologically linked to the phenomenon of credence. The one who goes into debt does so because he or she is given credence as the kind of person who will make good on their promise to cancel the debt, or at least to continue to pay the interest. And in many parts of the late capitalist world, of course, it is the ability to pay the interest that is most important. Let's put it another way. The one, the one who can be indebted has a name, a signature, but also a reputation that is creditable, as the, or as the bankers say, credit worthy. To say this, to speak of this worthiness implies a kind of judgment by which the debtor is not only measured, but seen, recognized, spoken of, or pointed to. Now, if the financial crises of 1997 and 2009 have taught us anything about anything beyond the rapacity of the banks, it is that accreditation does not only consist now, if it ever has, of assessing the value of an individual's assets. It also consists in judging others' judgments. Credit ratings and the function of the guarantor loom large in this process. But at the core is the impossible to know future of an individual's capacity to pay the interest. An impossibility that is itself the basis of an entire actuarial industry and insurance products that admit the possibility and make an incapacity to pay interest the basis of a new value. This is an entirely novel and one might say surreally immaterial territory of originary accumulation in which the possible future failure of a capacity to fulfill obligations can be speculated upon. That is the story, or at least one story, of capitalism. But now what of this worker, this worker who has not yet been, why might I say, redeemed by the Marxian attribution of dignity to labor, the worker who is always already the debtor? When the debtor, who has a debtor, rather than one who lives by divine grace, is always already one who works, who does, who fabricates in time that which will be deemed or not of value, when that debtor asks for credit, which is to say the capacity for debt, two questions arise. The first question is, does the debtor believe he or she is bound by the contract that identifies her or him as owing? 
This is not the same as a contract demand re demanding payment. Yeah, this is a contract in which one acknowledges being bound as owing. Capital and bourgeois ideology, as well as Christian theology, ask this question. That is to say, they question the would-be debtor. But the second question, the critical question, our question, can be posed as follows. Does the creditor believe in the debtor's belief that she or he is bound? Does the creditor believe in the debtor's belief that she or he is bound? We can rephrase this question. Does the creditor believe the debtor? Or does he or she believe in the debtor and thus in the institution of debt, which makes of work a question of obligation? I know this is Baroque, but you just gotta go with it. Like every good kind of Baroque piece, you won't be able to get out until you're at the very end. Part two, column 1.5. Southern African theory land. To believe or to believe in the debtor. This question and the response to it determines and afflicts vast populations of people, or rather the question of this question and the response to it determines and afflicts vast populations of people and especially formerly colonized people. There is an account to be given of these processes that have designated whole territories and populations as both incredible and non-creditable. But let us not shy away from the theological impulse buried in the economic question. We must speak today about the predicament of the damned. Yeah, Fanon recall spoke of the damné de la terre and not only the wretched of the earth, damned condemned, not only the wretched as we say in English. As I have already indicated, the people of South Africa of whom I speak would accept the interpolation Christian. Some are deeply devout. Others are at best practitioners of episodic ritual devotion. But almost all have been schooled in the rhetorical traditions and are familiar with at least some of the biblical narratives, as well as the forms of choral expression and sung community that are so important to Southern African Christianity. At the same time, at the same time, this Christianity is interleaved with ancestral belief, which remains powerful in the common sense of the place. It is, in fact, a common sense of place, a form of attachment to locality in both historical and geographical terms. For the most part, these commitments nourish each other. Filial piety and a notion of ideal lawfulness abide in both. Yet lawfulness in ancestral terms is not necessarily inscribed within the idiom or the theatrical metaphorics of the trial in the sense of having a final judgment or a final reckoning as it's a final settlement, one would say, as its paradigmatic instance and teleological endpoint. To the contrary, ancestors receive all who can find them and no weighing of the scales occurs as preliminary to recognition. One may desire to be a worthy ancestor, but this is a matter of how the living will recall one, not of how the ancestors judge one. The fact that popular justice meted out in informal communities against individuals who have transgressed the law in especially egregious ways is often oriented to preventing the return of the body to its place of origin proves this point. Such punishments work by withholding what the ancestors would not, recognition. Not forgiveness, but recognition. Forgiveness, in contrast, is a matter for the Christian church. According to the tenets of popular justice, absolute punishment works by blocking a relation that would otherwise permit the absorption of the transgressor into the temporally extensive, the discursively infinite domain of the ancestors. So let us consider what it might mean to be worthy of the capacity to bear debt that would enable survival in this damned world. Part two, column two, South Africa. When my young friends spoke of what it means to be rich men, they said with a certain self mockery, that a rich man is a man among men, someone with a voice in the country, someone who will be recognized by others when they pass by, who attracts their gaze. 
These are almost precisely the words spoken by the gambler in Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel of the same name. Remember, Zama Zama means to gamble. Reflecting on the compulsive flirtations with both gain and loss at the roulette table, on his squandering of wealth and the forgetfulness of disasters that winning induces, Dostoevsky's narrator says, I risked more than my life. I've dared and risked it. And now I am once again a man among men. The miners, both distant from the world of Dostoevsky's character and living in the long shadow of its economic forms, share an aspiration to being looked at, one that is intensified by mass mediatized life, but that actually precedes it. They actually say they wish to be men among men. One of them bears the rather common name of the area, a name that signifies the desire for renown in a specular order. His name translates as look upon him or in another idiom, regard. Narrating and enacting this hope for recognizability in that conversation on the broken down stone wall, the young Zamazamas simulate a scenario in which they are perceived by admiring observers and utter the words they most want to hear. You see that guy? In that moment, their small chorus abandons itself to the possibility of fame. And then they lament, but if you're simple like me, even if you pass by, they speak these words while miming a gesture of dismissal, flicking their hands at the spectral version of themselves in the moment that they are overlooked by others. Now I wanna suggest that this being overlooked and deprived of recognition is linked to the predicament of that radical indebtedness of which I spoke at the beginning of this lecture. These men know and reflect upon this very fact and speak eloquently about it. And what they enunciate in their discoursing upon what indebts them is the difference between being recognized, granted renown, and as they say, having a name on one hand, and being subject to a kind of name calling that operates by speaking of them in the third person rather than the second person. This distinction is complex and time today is brief, briefer than would be required to do justice to the issue, but let me just sketch out that argument in, in a very thumbnail manner. And to do so, I go back for a moment to Euro-American theory, theory land. To be named, as Judith Butler says, borrowing heavily from J.L. Austin, to be named is to be granted the condition of possibility of recognition in a manner that is once enabling and constraining. Now Derrida teaches us that to be named is to be granted recognition via a lexical choice that only simulates a singular relation between word and referent. For the name partakes of a categorical logic and is spectralized by alterity. But to have a name in the social common sense of South Africa and perhaps here is to be known by others, to have renown. The young men with whom I work desire this renown and it is important for them that they have a name which is spoken by others without derision. They desire to be spoken of in the third person in a manner that testifies to their capacity to be addressed in the second person by the bearer of sovereign power and in a manner that attributes to them sovereign power. Yes, they wish to be the kind of people to whom, for whom uh, an, an I-thou relation is possible. For them to be renowned is to be addressable and audible. It is to escape the predicament of subalternity as Spivak defines it, that terrible space in which one speaks but is only heard to say what power wants to hear. Renown is a form of speaking about that enables a speaking to to recall the Levinasian distinction. Renown is a form of speaking about that enables a speaking to but it is not easily assimilable to the Levinasian scheme and it does not aspire to equality. To the contrary, it avows hierarchy and at best in this world, the South African world, it interprets democracy as equal access to inequality. Nonetheless, this desire for recognition on the part of others for the status of having a name in the sense of renown is very different from the predicament which I would describe as being the object of name calling name calling or stereotypy, which encompasses every form of racism, substitutes a third person discourse for an act of naming. Panon analyzed this with precision. It takes the form of the you 
you denigrated category, yeah? In this gesture, the third person gesture hides like a poison in the second person address. This you is really a he, she, it. It is a refusal of interlocution. In this sense, its violent structure is simple. It displaces the act of speaking to based in a recognition of the singularity of the one named with an act of speaking about. Now this kind of name calling, which is not quite interpolation, is at the heart of all those actuarial discourses in international monetary policies that withhold recognition and attribute to whole categories of typed people the status of credit unworthiness. In the a previously quoted desire for renown, we hear this echo of a desire to be deemed a person worthy of credit, which is to say someone who can take on the debt that is involved in every purchase, every monetary transaction, every faithful promise to fulfill the obligation of the contract that falls upon the damned. All right, we're getting close to the end here. Part three, on surfeit, which is not a gift or fate without fatalism. Column one, South Africa. If God does not give favor and if credit is withheld, then what? Informal miners often talk about what ha might happen if they strike it rich. And what they aspire to is less the satisfaction of need than the valorization of desires apotheosis. So here is another conversation overheard underground. This one translated not from Chitonga, but from Izindbele. If I hit it big, I'm gonna park a car. Then I'm gonna buy groceries. After that, I'm going dancing. That will be the end of my Christmas. Now, translating this dialogue led uh, me and my translators to a kind of hilarious set of misunderstandings. I was completely convinced that I had misheard the speaker. I mean, why would you park a car if you struck gold? Wouldn't the first thing be to buy a car? Perhaps a very fancy car. And often enough, these men talk about their poverty as being indexed by their lack of a car, of being dependent on their legs. And in this land of automobility in which cars and other vehicles have for decades provided the symbolic infrastructure within which racialization and class differentiation takes place, the car is an index of wealth and the medium of spatial and social mobility. So it's important that the young miner describes his hope for wealth in an image of parking and repose, not speed or the thrilling velocity that violates the laws of the highway, not the rush of acceleration or the cinematic sequence of the passing trees. The dream of a parked car is a dream of economy's transcendence. It's a picture of surfeit a dialectical image of a stasis achievable only having, after having entered and exited the world of movement, including the movement out of the immobility that acute poverty entails, a passage beyond. And yet, this is not an image of grace, of the gift or favor in the sense used by these men. As we have seen, if only briefly, such a surfeit would be the product of risk, but not luck, and definitely not divine grace. It would exceed labor without betraying the importance of that labor and the corporeal skill and tactical understanding of the informal miner. But once again, it would prove nothing of God's or the ancestor's judgment. Now the parked car has its flip side, the image of the groceries, which the men, other men, uniformly deride as a mortifyingly banal concern. And they responded to this uh, uh, profession of desire with uh, really um, great mocking laughter. They derided especially this expenditure on groceries. And by contrast, I would say that women in general uh, say the opposite. Yeah, their first concern is groceries. I have never heard a woman speak about cars, whether to drive or to park them in this context. And we could unfold from here an entirely distinct discourse on debt and feminization for which another conversation would be necessary. But I will mark the place of a necessary addendum by stating that the always already indebted status of the people coded in the third person as other is only exacerbated by being name called woman. 
So let me try to conclude here with a gesture toward the re-narration of debt as both the mechanism for depriving people of sovereignty and for imputing that which is supposedly already within them. In this context, sovereign debt is the name and the figure of a capacity for indebtedness and thus worthy as an object of renown. Pauline discourse, which questions the degree to which chosenness can be inherited has as its flip side, this question of radical indebtedness, which is to say of worldly damnation, the inheritance of non-credit worthiness, which inaugurates for so many that disseminating narrative of unsettlement, which is both movement and debt. Now a coda might be possible here, and it would start with the last line of the description of surfeit, namely the dancing. Now, I confess that I'm a little reticent to go there, to that trope of dancing as an escape from economy, especially when dancing can be, as we know, the demand made of those enslaved, the dissimulation of value preservation as cultural form and pleasure. Similarly, dancing is a form of commodified culture on the mines in which black mine workers are made to show themselves as cultural beings through the exhibition of a dance transformed by the accoutrements of mining, namely gumboots, into a commodity value subtending the industry. But, and yet, the men with whom I work speak of dancing without hesitation as the concluding gesture of their celebrations in the event that they strike it rich due to their risk-taking and not by virtue of a favor or gift from God. Now this event is not the basis of a conversion narrative, this striking it rich. And that's both because of the paucity of the strikes, which tend to generate at most a few hundred dollars worth of gold, but also because we are speaking of a slightly different logic. The event in this case is not a conversion. These people do not exit the status of the damned that is to say those who are not the recipients of a divine gift. Dancing will be the end of their Christmas, but Christmas here is the time of mandatory giving, but also respite from work and in many cases a return home to those places of ancestral origin where the miners are otherwise both indebted and incapable of sustaining the recursive indebtedness of daily life. And I, myself, I am not sure how to speak of this dancing, except that it is perhaps like the laughter of which I have elsewhere written, an undecidable element beyond interlocution, but utterly within the social, beyond utterance, but not without iterability, temporal, without narrativity, in a word or two, beyond debt. All right, I have spoken at great length practically breathless way, and I will stop and um, and turn it back to Peter and Suzanne and all of you and see if there's something in this rather excessive discourse that might be of interest for our conversation. Thank you so much, Rosalind. I suggest we really, <laughs> it was wonderful, wonderful. So, so many thoughts, perspectives, uh, I'm still actually processing. Uh, I'm trying to, to you know, uh, receive uh, what, you, what you gave to us. Um, I'm sure there are many, many questions, remarks. I have some, but I don't want to, to begin or to, to monopolize here the, the microphone. Um, Please feel free to intervene, whoever wants. Maybe uh, with raised hands, uh, that's always a good idea and it makes it easier to, to manage. Yep, you know, Peter, I'm, I will watch the raised hand function. Okay, that's a good idea, thank you. Can I just ask something about the name calling? Mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 well, because for me, that then branches out to many, many other questions. But just 
how would you think about the name calling in relationship to interpolation? Right. Um, I mean, I, I think you kind of sort of parenthetically said, which is not interpolation or it's not quite interpolation. And, and, and the reason I, I, I asked that is, um, well, because it, 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 uh, it opens up your discourse into maybe a different kind of paradigm, of course, which would be that of ideology. And here's, you know, and, and sort of in the back of that is, you know, as you were speaking, I don't know why I kept thinking, I kept asking myself, hmm, what about the lie? What about if it's, you know, vis-a-vis -vis credibility or creditability and does one believe the debtor? You know, what if it's, you know, where's the function of like lying in here? <laughs> I don't know if that's, it's probably extremely uh, confused this question right now, but no, not at all. Great. Um, let me take it in two parts. Some of the people in this room have uh, participated in conversations around this question of name calling, uh, which is something we take up in this class on accusation. You're absolutely correct. It is in conversation with an Althusserian conception of ideology. And I, I so I'll, I'll just try and suggest that I am both um, um, taking up that theoretical um, analytic and I hope doing something a little bit different with it. So when the, you know, the typical, uh, you know, the, I suppose the caricatured reading of, of interpolation that, that, that we generally adduce when talking about Althusser is uh, one in which a person is hailed by ideology and finds themselves responding, despite the fact that the address is not actually an act of naming, yeah? So the, the paradigmatic instance, which is an oddly paradigmatic instance, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah, hey you, and you respond even though you have not been called by name. And Althusser said this is a mysterious element of ideology that you would respond nine out of 10 times, not always. There's always a, it's actually a significant element of failure in that that's often overlooked. Nine out of 10 times you respond. And this, so ideology is functioning in the, indeed in this way to um, in the mode of, or in the appearance of, it has the form of appearance of naming, which is not naming in the sense of granting people that singularity, which would allow for interlocution. This is an ideological element. Um, I mean, I guess I'm partly at a slant with Judith Butler's reading of Althusser because I feel that um, we are left without a means, you know, insofar as she is concerned with the individual who might make their corporeal nonconformity with the ideal, the basis of a uh, refusal of the interpolative gesture. I'm rather more interested in the kind of social logics by which the simulation of name, of, of granting of a name is working to actually exclude people from interlocution. Now, Althusser tells us in a footnote to that chapter, you know, the case of the policeman is actually an unusual example. It's not typical. Uh, and we're left to ask the question of, well, to what extent is that the paradigm, you know, the police state as the paradigm of, of ideological interpolation or perhaps a special case? Um, when I speak about name calling, I mean precisely to emphasize this element of the simulation of of, uh, uh, of interlocution that is part of the racial typing, the stereotyping, the blockage of the interlocutionary. It, and in terms of that framework that Levinas gives us, the difference between speaking to and speaking about, except of course that name calling is not a mode of knowledge production, right? That in, in that, you know, the speaking about is of a very specific kind, yeah? It is the designation of a, of a limit to interlocutionary exchange. Um, and maybe much more would have to be said about that, but that's, that's just, I think, I, I hope will clarify um, what is the case. I, I am invoking a discourse of ideology. I'm one of those old fashioned people who believes we should bring back the concept of ideology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, but not, you know, and not in the bad sort of silly way of false consciousness, but in some serious uh, manner. Um, and indeed, I think it's unfortunate that that Althusser's own analysis is much more subtle and complex than is often credited in the American readings of it. Well, because so much is dedicated to Catholicism. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, 
and psychoanalysis and uh, all that other stuff. Yeah, for sure. So your second question, um, sorry, can I ask you, Suzanne, to just uh, re repeat it for me? Um, well, it, it, it had to do with lying. With lying, yeah. that's right. So this is why I say that the process of accreditation is actually not a kind of question of truth production or a matter of assessing the, the, the real assets of an individual, i.e. Uh, attempting to verify the commitment to the contract of being one who owes, but it is the judgment of the judgment of others, as we know. I mean, you can lie all you want. It has nothing to do with whether you'll be granted credit or being allowed to become indebted. I mean, we have a spectacle of that in the American public sphere of scale we is hardly imaginable, right? I mean, so the capacity to assume debt is lift, lifts off from that question of truth telling and um, asset verification and anchorage in the real, uh, more and more and more so. And we might consider in the academy, we might consider the ways in which our own processes of assessment, tenure granting and so forth partakes of this logic, the judging of others' judgments, letters of recommendation rather than reading and so forth. Um, but I don't want to. I don't want to go too far down that, that rabbit hole. <laughs> but I, I think the lie is maybe not relevant in this economy. And that doesn't mean that it's not ethically relevant. For sure. Elizabeth, you have a raised hand. Um. Yeah. I mean, I I only have a kind of a dumb question. I'm absolutely fascinated with risk and with what your miners think about risk. And I don't completely understand. Um, so I'd like to understand better. And one of the, I guess one of my questions is, um, what are the rules of risk? Are there rules? Um, are there rules of risk in this, in this uh, world? Um... So, I mean, there are, there are hard and fast rules that are given by what the body can survive. Perhaps uh, there, there, there is also something like a, uh, a notion of labor time, but it's not that kind of metrical labor time that it becomes the basis of the calculation of value in a wage-based system because it is quite, quite simply, you know, you invest a certain amount to go underground. Uh, literally, you have to, some of the miners must pay security fees to enter a shaft. They themselves have appointed security guards to protect them from being press gang and so on. But you, there's a cash outlay, and often this is guaranteed with a surety, the form of a cell phone and so forth. You also have to pay to leave the shaft. So there is a cost. There's also the other cost of equipment and so forth. And quite simply, but at the level of the paying for insurance, life insurance, you could say, you have to get enough to come back up and you will extend your time underground to the point where you hit that absolute threshold of survivability in order to make that money back. And you could say that the risk intensifies as this time unfolds. But more than this, um, more than this, uh, uh, I would say, no, there isn't a set of rules about risk, but it is a willful exposure. I mean, these young men have a discourse of sovereignty that is constantly it, it, it suffuses their entire, their entire lives. They believe that they are undertaking this work by choice as a means of avoiding being employed by others. This risk-taking is itself sovereign. You know, It is the form of their sovereignty to bear it all themselves. And that doesn't mean that there are not actually gangsters and human trafficking in this world, but to the extent that there's a discourse about it, um, the determination to work for oneself is the first sovereign act. The second is the risking of life and limb. And, um, and one could say of investment vis-a-vis uh, -vis that totally uncertain thing of the return of gold. I don't know if that's helping you. So, so actually risk is, 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 is really fantasy. I mean, it doesn't, it's, there's never going to be a, a an actual result, a, a payback. It's, it's, it's a fantasy of achieving sovereignty. Risk is the means, the, the phantasmatic means of achieving sovereignty. Yes, I mean, there, there is a result. There is, you know, there are these momentary surfeits. 
there are these momentary eruptions of something that is um, that exceeds the labor invested, right? When someone gets more than anyone else, uh, but the, but the but the it's sovereignty is a phantasmatic uh, object for sure. Yes. No, it's never. I mean, there's there, nobody is ever going to get enough through the risk of mining to achieve this sovereignty. In my opinion, that's true. Yes. But in their opinion, yes, there there is. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because I mean, I, I I keep thinking, what is at risk? So what is at risk is not having the fantasy, right? Um, that is, what is at risk in terms of the problem of sovereignty? Yes, that that if if one if one was kind of so if the scales fell off one's eyes. Except this is the other part of the story is that all of these men constantly say that they would rather be doing something else that they despise this, that they would in fact prefer to have a kind of regular job, a waged job. These two discourses run alongside each other. There's no principle of non-contradiction. Insofar as they describe their acts as zamazamas, they say this is a sovereign act. That is those who are not trafficked, yeah? This is a sovereign act. This is a, a means of accessing that otherwise impossible uh, uh, escape from the economy entirely. Yeah. And well, that makes sense, it. though, actually. I mean, it's contradictory, but it makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Peter, you have the next hand up. Thank you. Um, I, so I don't know if uh, what I'm about to say amounts to a, to a question, and it is really a bit confused in, in my head uh, because, because you, I mean, there are so many things that I want to, to reflect upon. Uh, but I, I have uh, I, I have been sort of stuck also with the, um, this last uh, image that you shared with us, the, the parked car. Um, and I was wondering why, so why, why it struck me so. Um, of course, there is what you said, and I think uh, this is well, this isn't the main reason actually. You described it as a dialectic image. Um, and uh, when thinking about what, uh, in, in what ways the, 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 part car, the part car could be a dialectic image, I kept thinking about, um, on the one hand, circulation, uh, which is what cars do, uh, and on the other hand, um, standstill, right, uh, which is what a parked car uh, does or does not, rather. Um, so uh, again, this is not the question. This led me to think about what is so, what is at the center of our many of our discussions in this seminar, and uh, and what we will certainly talk about with you to uh, tomorrow, uh, which is the question of of time, um, as being the the where where the two uh, the two ledgers, as you would say. Uh, sort of, of brush against one another. Uh, I mean the two ledgers of narrative on the one hand and dead slash gift on, on the other hand. Um, actually, as a side question, this time a real question, uh, I was wondering what, what would you think um, if one were to describe uh, the difference between gift and debt in terms of um, not only time but speed. Uh, I mean, gift has gift is often conceptualized as immediate as uh, as the event. Derrida talks about it as the event, and uh, the event has a sort of absolute speed. And I guess it, this could also be said about a number of of uh, notions or categories that you brought to us today, like uh, grace. Um, etc. Uh, and that, on the other hand, I mean, uh, you know that more than anyone else here, uh, since at least most, uh, that, you know, uh, implies, certain, well, deferral, circulation, time, and so on. Uh, so immediacy versus deferral. Uh, now, I was wondering if in the background of this image of the car, 
and the idea that the parked car is a dialectical image, uh, which means, as I would understand it, uh, dialectical, dialectical image, at least if I think of Benjamin, it's a sort of circul well, maybe not circulation, but, but a conflict of forces or an economy, uh, a question of, of balance uh, at a standstill. You know? um, and so I was wondering, what, what about time in this in this image uh, that you that you shared with us? Uh, why is it a dialectical image? What about circulation? I, I know it's not really a question, but <laughs> many thoughts. <clears throat> this is very fascinating, and I'm I'm thinking with you. So um, let me try and learn from the question to extend what I had thought I was saying and maybe take it somewhere else. Um, so my understanding of Benjamin's concept of dialectical image is that in which certain contextual circumstances, transforming circumstances, allow one to perceive in an image a path that would not previously have been visible and that kind of forges a crossing, one could say, or convergence of two critical moments and not simply the present or the past, but by virtue of something in the present, this an image becomes available as a portal, you could say, through uh, onto the previous moment. One sees things one wouldn't have otherwise seen. So what is it that the car allows one to see? And I think what you said is extremely interesting. Um, that is, it would be, we would ask, what is the truth of the parked car? and not simply what is it as a kind of fantasy image or an object of wish, right? What is the truth of the parked car, this stasis, um, this um, in which the only thought about exiting the unbearable and temporally extensive uh, uh, narrativity of debt and indebtedness would be um, absolute stillness, an absolute, um, whatever, it's kind of still point in this, uh, in this economy, but also, and I think this is what you, maybe you're making me think. Um, I, I argued that, that they are not thinking of this in terms of the gift, yeah, not as grace. So what is, what is stasis without gift, you know? It's a frightening prospect. It's maybe, it's maybe death. Uh, and this of course is also the truth of this world underground, that what seems like, you know, this, what is the, the force of this phantasmatic image is this horrific, endless submission to catastrophic danger. I mean, I can't count the number of corpses that, you know, would lay upon the sides of the road if they were all gathered in one place at one time. But you, you are making me think that what is revealed there is not simply this fabulous freedom, this fabulous uh, extra, but also this death's head, um, uh, which is stasis without gift. Um, I, I would I would put that out there as a provisional beginning to think with you about that. I'm not sure. I, thank you for the for the provocation. Maybe you have some further thoughts about it. That this, would is, be great. this is great. Thank you. Uh, I the next hand I see I don't recognize the person. It, Ari, is that correct? Yes, it's Ari. Yeah. yeah okay. There we go. Thank you so much for this fascinating talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little more about laughter and debt. Uh, you mentioned towards the last part of your talk. So, thank you. Um, I'll, thank you, Arif. I, I will, you know, the laughter is a kind of enigma to me in this world. I've always been perplexed by how much laughter uh, is um, part of this world and that it doesn't, it's not assimilable to the kind of understandings of laughter with which I'm more familiar, either forms of aggressivity or forms of expenditure or all, all sorts of things. Um, and I, I, um, I, I, I have written and I'm trying to write about this, but the more important thing is how to think about it. You know, what is the nature of this laughter, which is not really of the order of the joke, which is not um, exclusionary and so forth. And I do, I do feel like I, maybe you have some ideas, yeah? That this is critical to understand. There is an interesting radical literary tradition in Southern Africa 
in which the question of laughter is actually thematized and not merely um, produced. Thematized as the object of a process of redemption. Um, so in the right uh, po poetries of say P Peter Abrahams in the middle of the century, he's also a great novelist who wrote this amazing novel about uh, called Mind Boy. Um, uh, you know, he speaks about a certain kind of freedom as a certain redemption of laughter. Now that is, I mean, in and of itself, you know, I, I don't know, to years it would take to understand what's at stake in someone saying that, you know, emancipation, he's writing at the very beginning of the apartheid era, emancipation would be the redemption of laughter. Like, what does it signify? And I don't think one, I don't think I know the answer. Um, but I do feel that insofar as these writers speak about laughter in some proximity to the question of redemption, that this would have to be understood also to a kind of escape from this form of indebtedness. Again, we have these figures, maybe one is a death head, maybe one is something else. I mean, the aim, the, the ambition here is to both inhabit the indebtedness, which is uh, you know, the condition of, of living, you could say, and to imagine forms of escape that aren't death, but that don't depend on this kind of, uh, you know, the eruption of a sovereign power that bestows that. So these people are constantly trying to think, I think, to do, to, 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 to uh, enact something other than, than, this, than what we're given by this binarity. And laughter might be one of those things, an ambivalent, complicated thing. Uh, that that's an inadequate response to the question, but uh, that's a bit. Thank you so like much. Yeah. Navjeet has her hand up. Thank you, Professor. This was really wonderful, and uh, I'm just going to try to frame a question because, as has been reiterated, I'm still trying to understand. Um, I wanted to come uh, to the beginning of your talk where you began and talked about. Uh, I have written the movement, but correct me if I have sort of quoted you wrong, where you sort of said the movement from political theology to economic theology. And um, even within the architecture of economic theology, which you sort of built for us, and I'm going to bring a very secular framework in terms of that, which you talked about, which was that in your case, the idea of being in debt and also the idea of the ceaseless work is sort of the condition of being damned, if I'm not wrong. But there is a certain way in which dignity in labor has been imagined. And that dignity in labor or imagination or particularly in the Marxist idea to imagine the dignity in labor also becomes crucial for a certain form of politics and so on and so forth. So I was wondering that in this gesture of recognizing the damned, both as a figure who is ceaselessly working and also is in debt, you know, this is a very speculative question, but you know, then what the, like the figure of the politics looks like, you know, that is one. And the second is that I'm very intrigued by the two images which you began, not two images, but the beginning of the lecture was with this idea of sovereign debt and you sort of took it to as a signifier of a certain capacity you know not sort of understanding it empirically but a certain signifier and then i wondered that you ended with dancing you know a very very corporeal gesture you know so i was wondering that if you see dancing as a response i don't want to use the word alternative because it's a very very bad word to use anyways but how do you think of the relation of sovereign debt and that moment in your ethnography of dancing? You know, does it sort of make a way of a way? I don't know how is it in tension with that economic theology of being damned, or you know, an exit from this idea of being in debt? I mean, this is just very speculative, and I'm very you can like if if this doesn't make sense, please you know. Ignore this. It makes perfect sense, Navji. Let me try and answer as briefly as I can, uh, which is not fair because they're huge questions. I mean, I made a, a brief gesture when I said this is a kind of position or this is a description of a world not yet redeemed by Marx's attribution of dignity to labor. Why would I say that? I mean, South Africa is the locus of an incredibly rich, robust Marxian theoretical tradition 
um, often quite Althusserian in inspiration. Articulation theory basically, you know, lives and breathes there. Uh, you know, th this is true both theoretically, but also politically. The Communist Party is a member of the Tripartite Alliance and so forth. That is not true of the informal world, which is oddly kind of um, exterior to that political tradition and that um, maybe not so oddly exterior to it as a theoretical tradition, you know, what people desire. I mean, these, young, these men do not accord labor dignity. In fact, they speak quite explicitly about the humiliations of that they are subject to in their bodily uh, existence, the, the, the scars they bear, the, the filth they have to uh, wear, the fact that they must breathe underground insects that have been sitting upon excrement, human excrement, all these things, are, there is no dignity in this labor. There is dignity in knowledge, in skill, in corporeal uh, knowledge, but this is not yet dignity in labor in the complex kind of Marxian sense. Now, I, of course, do not share this <laughs> analytic, but I'm trying to describe to you theirs. Um, and it, it, a second task would be, and it is both a political and a theoretical task, is there a way in which that understanding of, la a different understanding of labor might enter in here as something other than damnation? On the other hand, this is difficult under these extreme circumstances. But your second question about the signifier, now uh, the dancing, we could borrow a little Yeats here. Um, to, uh, you know, to speak of the signifier is to speak of language as in some ways at the level of the dancing, yeah? Uh, the, the material, um, concrete, uh, la langue, the, the thingness, the audibility, that which is in the ear, of that by which association works, that which operates on the unconscious. So, um, but that said, you are correct to say that in when I opened, I spoke of it more in terms of a kind of con conceptual structure. That is to say, in terms of a signified, not a signifier. And maybe you're correct that in the dancing, one can speak of the signifier of sovereign debt, not the signified. But I will have to bear that with me as I, as I go. It was a very good question. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, there was a question in the chat and I, oh, I will read it out. Um, I didn't see the chat, sorry. I, I, just, I just got wind of it. So um, it's from Alexandra uh, Joy Foreman. Mm -hmm. she said, I am listening in from Brazil and I wonder how you would apply your discussion of debt and gift to corruption and lying in the context of this political climate moment, for instance, such as government involvement in destroying the Amazon or in the political question of economy versus lockdown for money versus life. Right. Well, um, you know, I guess I suppose that I would hope, I, of course, you know, people who know more about the um, Brazilian situation and about the crisis of gold and, uh, and the mines in um, the Amazon there should speak about this and could speak about it more than I could. But when I speak about that condition of radical indebtedness as that which is in fact attributed, imputed, accusatively um, uh, laid upon, you know, these vast territories and communities of people who are denied creditworthiness and deemed to be incredible in their aspiration. I'm speaking about those people who like in Brazil end up in the extremely terrifyingly beautiful filmic portraits of Salgado, you know? Uh, so yes, but this is not an analysis that can help us um, track down or pursue uh, the people who are, say, say, for example, the mining corporations that are culpable for profiting off of people's, uh, uh, not only the extraction of their surplus value, but off their corporeal wastage. That is a different project. It's an important project, but it is not one for which this analysis, I think, would offer a particularly useful starting point. But these there's room for all of these things, I think, and the necessity for all of these things. In South Africa, uh, currently, you know, for the first time ever, Successful cases are being brought against mining corporations for the decades of illness and death due to silicosis as a result of mining. And all these, you know, these, these kinds of political projects are so important. And I participate and share those ambitions, but that's not, this, 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 this paper is not gonna help you with that, I'm afraid. Uh, Nicolas. Rosalind, uh, thank you so much for this uh, incredible talk. My, really, my, my head is still spinning about some of the things that, that, that you said. Uh, and um, 
your conversation with uh, with South African miners reminded me uh, a little bit of uh, Michael Tausig's uh, work with Bolivian miners uh, and the figure of the Tio, uh, the uncle, uh, this figure that guards the miners and for whom altars are, are kept inside of the mind. Uh, and the mine as a sacred space itself in, in which Catholic and Andean um, traditions blend. Uh, as you presented, I kept thinking of the, of the mountain of uh, Potosí uh, as this foundational space of the conquest of the Americas and of capitalism. Uh, you talked a little bit about primitive accumulation and I recall that uh, Marx described primitive accumulation as the original scene of capitalism. Uh, and we could say that political economy and, and business administration increasingly is sort of like it's, it's gospel. Uh, uh, so the, the extraction of, of silver from Potosí was justified uh, or condemned on a theological basis uh, by, by uh, Spanish uh, theologians. Uh, and Pauline Gray's, uh, the, the gratia gratis data, the free giving grace was an important part of, of the argument. Uh, uh, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more perhaps of, of the mine itself as a, as a potentially uh, sacred or, or not sacred space within, within capitalism, capitalism or in connection to, to, to labor in capitalism. Uh, so to put it another way, if you could speak a little bit more about how the narrations of, of miners in South Africa uh, in relation to risk, labor, and debt might be connected to the space of the mine itself, to the mountain, to earth, or, or to the minerals, or if they're connected at all. Um, yes, Nicolas, there's so much to say there. I've, I've written, like, you know, rather too much about it, but um, a couple of things that one could say. I mean, first of all, you know, South Africa produced more gold than in South Africa's deep level, mines produce more gold than all the other countries in all the world across all of history. This made it a very specific, uh, significant uh, entity within a world economy that was increasingly uh, and, and periodically, episodically linked to a gold standard. The gold standard being, as you know from Marx's writing, uh, gold being a very specific enabling condition of possibility for the globalization of the economy. World economy is for Marx dependent upon this development. And you could say, you know, that, that links South Africa in a very important way to the original sin that makes gold play the role it does in the development of the world economy. Now there's so much to say about the specific dimension of gold mining in South Africa, the combination of abundance and its de in its deepness and its widespread distribution. Um, you know, the Chamber of Mines produced in 1969 a, a PR book that said, you know, think about the think about the South African uh, geological formation as a giant dictionary, and then you think about. <laughs> all of the pages that have been somehow strewn beneath the earth. And then the amount of gold that you're looking for comprises one comma, one comma from all of those pages of that huge thousand page, 1200 pages of dictionary. So, and this necessitated all sorts of things, including for example, really what made South African gold payable after it had went into deep level mining was the invention of the cyanide process. And there commences another history of the toxification of the world. Um, and I, I'm treating that in a new book that I'm writing. But um, the, that said, there was mining in South Africa from at least, you know, for at least 1500 years. Gold was traded from Mapungubia to, 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 to the Arab world and to China already in the 9th to 11th centuries. But, uh, and that gold does seem to be associated with certain kinds of sacralizing discourses to the extent we can judge it. Very, very little archeological material for that. The miners, you know, the difference, I'm talking about people who inhabit the ruins. These are not formally people, people implied, employed in the formal mines. And, you know, so their post-industrial informal consciousness is different from the consciousness of even, even formal laborers in the, in the deep level minds of the capitalist sector. You know, um, certainly it was self-sacralizing, capitalist self-sacralizing, um, but there's nothing, there's nothing, people make offerings in the mines to their ancestors, but they're not making offerings to the mine. It is not the mine itself. It doesn't have the status of the, mo of the mountain. There's not, nothing like Pachamama. There's, and I always feel it important to say, you know, I mean, we learned so much from Tausig's analysis, but he learned so much from June Nash. Let us not forget her in this uh, story. Um, uh, but it seems that there are both overlaps. And of course, we know that the silver of Potosí 
uh, was one moment in the globalization of the economy associated with merchant capitalism. And we know that gold was a different moment. And if you look to the late 1890s, again, if you wanna do the historical analysis, the, the debates even in the United States between the gold bugs and the advocates of, 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 of bimetallist um, economics, are you know are the sites of the resacralization and the kind of phantasmatic borrowing of all sorts of other discourses about people's investment in people's understanding of the fecundity of the earth and maybe that trope the fecundity of the earth is one of the means by which a kind of secular sacralization takes place um, and certainly the discourse of natural resource is one of the one of the ways in which that appears but um, I, you, 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 you had a lot in your question and I think I probably touched only a tiny bit. Thank that. you, thank you, Rosalind. Well, I, I don't see any more raised hands. And uh, I think that uh, well, we, we, have the, we are very lucky to have you also uh, tomorrow morning in the, in the Pembroke seminar uh, where we can absolutely continue this discussion. And I think that many of us will uh, take this moment between now and tomorrow to you know, just think about all the things you said. Uh, we also have um, readings for tomorrow, um, an essay that you very generously shared with us on, on uh, Gift and, and Derrida, and Derrida's book uh, itself, uh, Given Time. So, well, I want to thank you really warmly again for, for this wonderful talk. And I very much look forward to continuing the discussion uh, tomorrow morning with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for these excellent, excellent questions. And I'm gonna think with them for a while. I look forward to tomorrow. Uh, you will tell me if there's anything I should do to, to prepare, but I think, I think I've given you too many words already. <laughs> No, no, no. But I think we, we have many, many things to discuss. So I, I think it would be nice to have just an open discussion of, of these three uh, rich materials that, that we have. Your talk today, um, your, your essay on Derrida's gift, and, and uh, Derrida's given time itself. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much again. Thank you.